Example 8.3.2. All right, before we get into the setup for this one, I should have mentioned this on the previous example as well. We are, in this chapter, we are looking at ways to value stock. We're looking at two different models that we can use to value stock. The first one that we're looking at is what's called the dividend discount model, often abbreviated DDM, and it does exactly what it sounds like it does. With the dividend discount model, we forecast out the expected future dividends, and we discount them back to present value using a discount rate that accounts for the risk of those cash flows, and we find the, the present value of them, and that becomes our intrinsic value of the stock. That is what we think it's actually worth. And once we get that intrinsic value, we can go back and compare that to the actual price and see if we expect the, talk, the stock to pay us a rate of return that would compensate us for the risk that we believe is in it. So example 8.3.2 was uh, an example of preferred stock. It was using the dividend discount model. <clears throat> and with a preferred stock, we usually just got a perpetuity, so level cash flows at regular intervals that last forever. The next example, 8.3.2, is going to add just one more wrinkle to it, and that's a that's a growth rate. As well, let's just let's just go into it here. The setup says: suppose you are considering buying a stock. You expect the stock to pay a dividend of five dollars one year from today, and the dividend will grow two percent each year after that. Using the CAPM or capital asset pricing model, you estimate your required return at ten percent to compensate you for the risk of the stock's cash flows. What is the maximum price you are willing to pay for a share of stock? So we've got almost the identical setup from the previous example, but what we've added now is a growth rate. And typically when we're trying to price a share of preferred stock, that'll be a level cash flow, but common stock will fluctuate over time. And it's very difficult to forecast what dividends are actually going to be in the future, especially more than a, than a year or two out, because in order to get to the dividend, you would first have to accurately forecast the firm's revenues and expenses, and, and so forecast their future earnings, and then you would also have to forecast what of those earnings they're going to pay out in a given year. So that is a lot of moving pieces, and it is very difficult to make accurate predictions in that way. So what will typically happen if you ever read an analyst report is the analyst will forecast out specific dividends, one, maybe two, uh, if you ever see one past two or three years, you just know that it's pure fiction, but sometimes you'll see them. And at some point, after one or two years, instead of forecasting specific dividends, they'll assume a set growth rate. Let's say, and from here on, we expect the dividends to grow at 2% per year forever, right? And it's just kind of a simplifying assumption because you know your, your forecast, if you try and forecast something specific, it's not going to be accurate anyway. Um, but we do kind of expect at least a healthy company to have growing dividends over time. And so that's it's just kind of a simplifying assumption. Um, and it's kind of the best we can do with the available information idea. So that's kind of what we got here, but we're just going to jump right into the growth rate. We've got a time value money problem. Again, we're using the dividend discount model. So what we're going to want to do is forecast out the dividends and then discount them back at a rate that accounts for the risk of those cash flows to get the present value, which is going to be our intrinsic value for the stock, what we think it's worth. All right, so time value money problem, we're going to use our three-step process. We're going to start by mapping out the cash flows. All right, so at time period zero is when we're trying to come up with the value of the stock. We're trying to find the value here. Our discount rate that we're going to use to estimate the present value is 10%, and that was derived using the capital asset pricing model, so this is our minimum required return. So when we use this as a discount rate, what we're going to come up with is kind of the maximum price we would be willing to pay, All right, the maximum price that would give us this return, this minimum return. Okay, so 10% discount rate. Then we need to forecast out our cash flows. The problem says we expect the stock to pay a dividend of $5 one year from today. So that first cash flow is going to be out here at the end of year one. And then the dividends are going to grow at 2% each year after that. So to forecast the future dividends, we can just take that first dividend of $5 and multiply it times one plus the growth rate. So that'll grow at 2%. So we're forecasting the dividend at the end of year two is going to be $5.10. And then if we want to forecast the dividend three years from today, we could take that initial dividend of $5 and then grow it at 2% twice by just squaring the quantity of 1 plus the growth rate. And so we'll see that the dividend at the end of year three, we expect to be $5.20. And then this pattern is just going to go on forever. Right? We've got everything mapped out. Our next step is to identify the type of cash flow that we're looking at. Well, we have cash flows at regular intervals. They're happening once per year at the same time, and they are growing at a set rate and they last forever. They last forever, so we know that it's some type of perpetuity, and then we've got just a, a regular perpetuity and a growing perpetuity. 
And in this case, the cash flows are growing at a set rate, so we know this guy is a growing perpetuity. All right, once we've identified it as a growing perpetuity, there's really only one tool available in order to evaluate these guys. We, we can't plug them into the calculator or do them in a spreadsheet very easily, at least not by forecasting out the cash flows. Uh, we just kind of have to use the formula because the infinite nature of the cash flows. All right, so the present value of a growing perpetuity formula is this guy right here, where the present value of a growing perpetuity at time t is equal to the cash flow at time t plus 1, so one period later. And that's, that's always the case with these perpetuity formulas. Um, it's always giving you the present value one period before the cash flow that you plug in. There's always that timing difference there. Right? And we take that cash flow and we divide it by the quantity of our discount rate, little r, minus the growth rate, g. That's going to give us the present value of that cash flow stream. So when we plug in the information we've got from this problem, the cash flow one year from today, remember we're looking for the, the present value as of today, time period zero. The cash flow one year from today is $5.00. Our discount rate is 10%, expressed as a decimal is 0.1, and our growth rate is 2%, expressed as a decimal is 0 0.02. All right, so order of operations matters here. This guy, the denominator is in parentheses, so we want to go ahead and do that subtraction first before we do the division. All right, once we do 0.1 minus 0 0.02 to get 0 0.08, then we can divide 5 by 0 0.08, which comes out to $62.50. All right, now what does that number mean? I already kind of hinted at it earlier. Since we use 10% as our discount rate, that's our minimum required return in order to compensate us for the stock. The price we're getting back is the maximum price we can pay and still expect to earn 10% on this investment. We're assuming the cash flows in the future are fixed. We're, hold, we're pinning that piece down and holding it constant. All right? So if we were to pay more than $62, or let's, let's start here. If we were to pay exactly $62.50, and then receive this infinite stream of cash flows that we're expecting, we would earn exactly 10% on our investment, which is what we need to compensate us for the risk. If we paid anything more than $62.50 today, right now, and then still received these same cash flows, our rate of return would be lower than 10%, and it wouldn't be enough to compensate us for the risk associated with that investment. If we were to pay anything less than $62.50 for that share of stock today, then our rate of return would be greater than 10%, and it would be even more attractive to us because it, was, it would more than compensate us for the risk. All right, so that's how we use the information from the dividend discount model. We'll calculate an intrinsic price, what we think it's actually worth, and then we'll go and take that price that we calculated and compare it to the price that the stock is actually trading for out in the market, and we can use that to make buy or sell decisions, which we'll do in future examples.